I uh, became interested in Randolph Caldicott a long time ago because since the time I was a college student, I began um, thinking about and writing about the history of children's books. And um, I realized that it was a subject within the world of art and literature that was underexplored and underappreciated. And um, one of the things that I learned uh, fairly early on was that Randolph Caldicott was a revolutionary figure. He's someone who had a new idea about how a book could be made and how it could be illustrated and how it could be brought to life. Um, and that's what I want to show you in some of the pictures uh, you're about to see, along with something about what kind of person he was. I came away um, from having written a, a short book about him feeling that he was somebody I really wish I could have known, and I bet you would feel that way too. Um, so let's have the first slide. Um, so he's best known in the world today because this medal was named after him in the 1930s by American librarians who were looking to inspire um, American illustrators to make books for the children of the United States. Uh, in those days, America was an industrial powerhouse and had saved England and France during the First World War, but was still kind of um, a, a second-class citizen of the world culturally. And so we were looking as Americans to England and Europe for the best children's books. And the librarians in America said, we should, have, we should be making some of those ourselves. And they thought, what better way than to create a medal uh, which would inspire American artists to do that. So you have to be American to win this medal, even though it's named after an Englishman, Randolph Caldicott, which seems a little funny, but that's the, that's the reason. And it, it actually kind of makes sense. It was a way of paying homage to England as the kind of mother country, the source of, of um, the genre and the inspiration for making beautiful children's books. But the idea was to move into the future where books would, would come from America too. So take a quick look at this image. And now I'm going to show you the drawing by Randolph Caldicott that this is based on. Let's see the next picture. Mm -hmm. There. Uh, and that's from one of his 14 picture books, which he created in seven years. And to me, this image just epitomizes everything that's great about him. Because in the old days, before him, a, a children's book would have a block of type and a very static picture sitting next to it. But Caldicott was interested in just exploding action onto the page, very much in the spirit of children who are always you know, jumping around and full of energy. Um, and as you'll see, I mean, he's, um, he doesn't have room for words in this page. And he thought that was OK. Uh, you would just get immersed in this world and um, feel closer and closer to all the action that was happening. And there's a lot of really funny stuff going on here, um, like these birds which are scared out of their wits as the horseman comes by. Um, and even this little baby here. And that shows you that Caldicott was not a sentimental person. Um, he was all about you know, the spirit of life. And um, he thought that children wanted to know about um, real life. Um, and he also put a funny twist on it to make it even more interesting. Um, so the next picture is Randolph Caldicott himself. And he had red hair, a long beard, as you can see. He was tall and lanky. And though he was, he loved sports and uh, games and hanging out with his friends, uh, he had scarlet fever as a child. His heart was damaged. So he, his health was actually very fragile all of his short life. He didn't live to the age of 40. Uh, but he was a man, a child, and then a man in a hurry. There were things he knew he wanted to do. He doodled in his um, school books when he was growing up in Chester. Uh, he was born in 1846. Um, and then, um, a little bit later, he became a bank clerk, and he doodled on the bank slips. Okay. And that's how he learned how to draw. So let's, yeah. So this is like the house, not the house, but very much like the house in Chester where he grew up. Um, it's sort of like a, um, an early form of apartment house. There are two la layers here. There's a kind of um, walkway, an arcade. Um, and there were apartments within this building for more than one family. And they lived on the second floor. Um, there were 13 children in the family, um, including the ones that came with um, his father's second wife, because his first his mother died and then mother remarried. He was um, pretty high up in the age 
range of the family. He was the third eldest child and the eldest male. So he had lots of chances to tell stories to younger children and to begin to understand what kids enjoy. Um, next slide. Um, and there's a view of the street. And you can see how, in some ways, it's a little bit like, like Whitchurch. Um, those half-timber buildings and the beautiful old clock, for example. Um, and he brought some of these images, both from Chester and from Whitchurch, into the picture books that he created uh, a little bit later on. Next picture. Um, that, I hope you can see that. It's a watercolor of people, men, chasing their hats on a windy day. Um, Caldecott's father was a hatter. Uh, he was also an accountant. A lot of people had two different jobs to make a living. So I think this is a great example of Caldecott's um, gentle but very pointed sense of humor. He may have been thinking of his father, who I'm sure was very proud of the hats that he made and sold for people. And here you can see that nature could get the better of you and um, your hat could just blow away one day. Um, next picture. Okay, so here we are in a very familiar scene. Um, and in the next picture you'll see how an example of how um, he worked uh, familiar places into his artwork. Next picture, please. Oh, wait. Ah, correction. Um, th these are uh, fellow bank clerks. Uh, Caldecott's father was very worried about his son's future. And he said, you must do something that will ensure you a living. So he got him a job as a bank clerk. And originally here in Whitchurch, later in Manchester, and so what did he do? He was actually a very good bank clerk. You know, he didn't get fired, but uh, whenever nobody was looking, he drew his fellow clerks and uh, completely taught himself how to draw. Uh, next picture. Ah, here we are. So here is the famous church and clock tower, and there it is in one of his books. Um, so nothing was wasted on him. And uh, I subtitled the book I wrote about him, The Man Who Could Not Stop Drawing, because that's really how it was. Uh, if he was on a train, he would be sketching out the window. Uh, if he took a, a ride into, on a horse into the countryside, he would be sketching the trees and the, and the flowers and everything. Um, and eventually, he became incredibly skilled. Um, next picture. Um, and then he moved on to Manchester, where again he had a job as a bank clerk. But there, um, there were artists and there were artist societies and all kinds of ways for him to advance his interest in the thing that he really loved, which was art. Uh, and he began as a freelancer to publish drawings in magazines and newspapers. So it was like his first credentials as a real artist. Plus he was saving his money up. And by the time he was 26, he was ready, he felt, to move to the big time, which was London. And there he established himself uh, as a freelance artist right away, uh, which is not easy. Um, next picture. Um, more sketches of bank clerks. Uh, he, was, he was getting to be good. And he, he actually um, refused commissions to do portraits. He would be asked by people once he became well known, would you draw a portrait of my wife or so on. But he didn't trust himself because he was, such, he was so honest as an artist and his eye always went toward the odd or the, um, uh, the thing that one would satirize in a person's face. Mm -hmm. And he didn't want to hurt anyone. <laughs> and he knew that he was bound to do that if he painted someone's portrait in, a, in, an, in, in what, from his point of view, was an honest way. Uh, next picture. So he moved to London, and he found the absolutely best address for a young artist. It was in this building on Great Russell Street. Um, this is a bookstore, rare bookstore, which is still there, Jarndyce. And his rooms were right up here on the top floor. And the reason that it was the greatest place for a young artist to be living is what was across the street, what he could see from those windows. And that's the next picture. And that was the British Museum. You know, so he haunted the British Museum. And of course, that's an encyclopedic museum where everything imaginable that you might want to learn how to draw from Greek sculptures to different kinds of you know, animal specimens. It's all there, um, all there for the picking. And on some days, he just stayed in the courtyard and sketched the pigeons. Um, next picture. Um, well, among the f many famous things that are there, Elgin marbles. Next picture. And probably too hard to see, but he, he produced dozens of sketchbooks. And some of them are very beautiful you know, in their own right. Um, 
Next picture. Um, he also loved to, um, he had lots of friends and he communicated by letter with many of them and almost invariably put a little drawing at the top for the enjoyment of his, of his friend. And that's where this comes from. And here you see him sort of rhapsodically at his drawing table um, with the address, 46 um, uh, Great Russell Street uh, there, so you could see where he was writing from. Um, he almost looks like Beethoven, like conducting a <laughs> symphony. Yeah. Um, and something else that you can see in this drawing, which became characteristic of his books and of th other things that he did later on, was how few lines there are in the drawing. He was trying to animate his drawings. And we'll see later examples of other Victorian illustration where it feels like an overfurnished room, you know, the image. Uh, like every, every bit of space is filled in and with detail of one kind or another, ornamentation. Um, here, you can almost see through this drawing. Um, and he's as much interested in the action and the energy of this character who happens to be himself as he is in the physicality of it. Um, so th it's a kind of very liberated way of drawing. And that's what was so new about what he did. Uh, next. Um, so here is an example of the kind of um, cartoons that he created for magazines and newspapers when he was doing one-off freelance work on a regular basis. And if you can see that, there are two trombones you know, in an orchestra and the slides of the trombones are getting crossed and sort of tangled up in each other. Um, so he was always looking for the comic moment or the comic opportunity in, in an ordinary situation. You could well imagine this a scene from a Charlie Chaplin movie too. Um, and I'm, you know, Cha Chaplin grew up in England and he's born in here. And y it's very likely that he would have seen something like this growing up. Um, next picture. Uh, and here he is again, um, probably also from a letter. And his hair looks like he's been shot through with electricity. Um, he, 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 he made fun of other people, but he most of all made fun of himself. Uh, he was a good sport in that regard. Um, and he was very um, proud of his work. And he took a little bit from his bank experience. He was a pretty uh, shrewd businessman when it came to managing his own career. Um, so here he's um, chatting up some potential art buyers uh, for a painting that uh, he's um, been very proud to produce. Okay, next picture. Um, he took a little side trip into sculpture. Uh, in, in London, early on, he met a man um, who was French, uh, a French sculptor, and wanted to learn English. So Caldecott and he made a trade. Uh, Caldecott said, I will teach you English if you will teach me how to be a sculptor. Um, and he created this cat. And over in the Heritage Center, where there's an exhibit now about uh, Caldecott with some of his original art, which I urge you to go see, it's wonderful, um, there's a, a replica of this very cat. Um, for whatever reason, he decided not to pursue sculpture. I mean, this is a pretty, really well done piece of work, for, especially for someone who hadn't ever done it before. Um, but again, nothing Caldecott did went to waste, and as we'll see in the next picture. Um, this is from one of his first two picture books. And you can see that that cat there is really the same cat, the same pose, everything. Um, OK, next picture. Um, another example of one of his cartoons, you know, there's that old saying, um, art is long, life is short. So he <laughs> visualized that. Um, yeah, and of course he was very tall, so in a way that's a self-portrait. Um, next picture. And then um, he was very well established. I mean, in my American terms, he probably would have been illustrating for The New Yorker um, had he been living later in a later generation. Um, the graphic was a very um, popular and I think well thought of magazine, which had which published um, illustrations in color, which was an expensive thing to do. You know, it made it a s very special kind of publication in those days. And he um, worked for them on a regular basis for a number of years before he started making children's books. And some of his uh, pieces they were they were um, stories that went on for several images um, in sequence, almost like a comic book. Um, but they tended to be about like traveling in France, for example, and all the 
you know, humorous things that might happen to you when you were exploring the Riviera, let's say. Um, and they're beautifully observed and beautifully printed. Um, okay, next picture. He also illustrated a few books. You can see that he was um, very enterprising and game to try all kinds of things. Um, this is a book of stories by the well-known, at that point, American writer Washington Irving. And he was considered like the father of American literature in a way, the first significant writer to be produced by the United States. And Caldecott got the prize of illustrating this book. Um, and let's just look inside on the next slide. And you can see for a story called Christmas Day how he, how he presented the title as these um, letters made out of sticks or pieces of wood uh, strung along in a tree and in a, in a very characteristic called a cut touch the Y from the word day has fallen off the sign and is lying in the snow. Um, he loved that, like the flaw, the thing that goes wrong, um, which is so human. He was always doing that in his art. Next. Yeah. So going back to the time of his childhood, I mentioned he was born in uh, 1846. Most children's books, books that he as a child would have seen, in fact all children's books were printed in black and white. And if um, there was color, as you see here in a book from the late 1830s, it was because somebody hand colored it. The technology didn't yet exist to print color uh, in his childhood days. So children's books by our standards, and even by the standards of, of his adult uh, contemporaries, were very drab looking. Um, but they were also coloring books, so they were like do-it-yourself kinds of books. Um, next slide. But children's books at that time of his childhood were also becoming really funny. And some people were moving away from the idea that a children's book should just tell you how to behave well, for example, or how to prepare for salvation if you were uh, of a relig religious cast of mind. Instead, um, people like Edward Lear were creating books which were all about making fun of, of adults, you know, and, and just giving children a good laugh, basically. Um, the Book of Nonsense became a classic. This came out in the year that he was born. Uh, next slide. And then 20 years later, Alice in Wonderland continued that new trend. And Caldecott loved these things, you know, and the humor that he brought to children's books really is connected to the humor of people like Edward Lear and Lewis Carroll and Carroll's well-known illustra illustrator, uh, John Tenniel. Um, next picture. Um, so another thing that was happening, so we, so we're, we're about to see color come into children's books, and we're, we've just saw humor come into children's books. And something else that happened in Caldecott's early years was the advent of trains and the way that transformed the way everybody thought about life. It speeded everything up, made faraway places not really that far away. Um, it just changed the, the pace of life and made it exciting in a way that people uh, had never experienced before. And because it was such a big phenomenon, um, Artists felt they had to express it or somehow capture it in their work. So, next slide. So, Joseph Turner in this painting, which is at the National Gallery, produces this painting of a, of a locomotive, but you can barely see the train. It's not so much about the thing as it is about the energy and the speed of the train. So, artists were responding to a new era in the world's history by making art in a, in a new way, thinking of images in a new way. Next picture. Um, and Edward Mybridge, photographer, was also interested in capturing motion um, any way he could using cameras uh, with stop action photography. Um, next picture. And people were starting to invent devices which led to the motion picture. And Caldecott was very much a part of this same spirit as an artist. And if you think back to that picture I showed you that the metal was based on, that galloping horseman, that's really the counterpart in his work to what these people were all trying to do in art. Um, next picture. Um, even children's books by other people were starting to be about trains because children were so fascinated by this new phenomenon. Next picture. Um, and, uh, yet another thing that happened around the time Caldecott was a young person was Western artists in England and France became aware of what was, ha what was happening in, in Japan, in the, in the Far East. And because uh, these prints suddenly came over to Europe and were studied by Whistler and Caldecott, I'm sure, and Kate Greenaway and others. 
And the, the really striking thing was how, how simplified the image is. It's not simplistic, but it's pared down. And it's the opposite of that Victorian, you know, like overstuffed sofa kind of approach. Um, and this became a revelation for Caldecott, I think, in the way he simplified his idea of drawing and how to make an image feel like it's alive. Next. Um, here you can see an example. Like, there's so much of that uh, page is just nothing, you know, but he's letting your mind go into that space. And th for children, that in particular, it's, it's a way of getting them engaged uh, for the first time in looking at something abstract on the page. Next page, uh, next uh, slide. So here, by contrast, is Walter Crane uh, in the more old-fashioned way of filling a page with stuff. <laughs> So this is the thing Caldecott was moving away from. They shared a printer, uh, like printer publisher, and I have a feeling they didn't really like each other that much because they were so different in, in temperament and approach. Next, yeah. So here, if you can see it, um, is, are his first sketches for the house that Jack built. They're just the f most minimal lines indicating motion. Uh, they're like those action lines in a comic book you know, the, the, the show the characters running by, whizzing by. Um, and he actually said in one of his letters, the fewer the lines, the better, um, the less chance for error. Um, so um, he was really working on an abstract level uh, that had not been seen before, certainly in children's books. Next, yeah. So there's that cat again. And what, but what's interesting here is to see how he would often put a picture in color next to a picture in black and white. And if you think about it, um, you see this, and you take it in as reality, and then you look over here, which is much more abstract, and suddenly your mind is able to fill in what's missing. So he's really getting the viewer involved in a, a very active way. Um, and that's not you know, coincidental. He was looking for ways to connect with the person looking at his work. Next. And motion and action was one of his favorite things. Um, and again, hats blowing away. <laughs> um, I think he mostly liked his father, but I think he definitely did not want to be a banker, so uh, maybe that was his way of uh, getting back. <laughs> uh, next picture. Um, and this one, if you think about it, um, it's almost an animation. Um, this is the left side, this is the right side. This is happening later than this, so it's like a flash forward in a film. Um, you know, this character is running right into the crack in the middle of the book, like it could disappear into that void, possibly. You don't know. Um, and um, so everything about it, it, it maximizes the sense of something happening on the page. Um, he also would take a sentence. I mean, ordinarily, you would think at least, um, at, a, at, a, at a minimum, there'd be one sentence per page on a book. But he would break up a sentence into, into two and three word pieces and carry it over, over several pages, just one sentence. So he was creating pacing, um, which is key to animation and to, and to actually to, you know, to all, story, all really powerful storytelling. And part of the impact of that was you would, you would be brought to um, a point in the narrative where you didn't know what the next word in the sentence was going to be. So you have to turn the page, you know. So, so he's creating suspense using a very, very minimal technique, but with maximum effectiveness. Next picture. Um, and this is from Hey Diddle Diddle, the cat, um, uh, the, um, <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a nonsense rhyme. And um, the dish runs, runs away with the spoon. They're eloping. But Caldecott um, added a coda to th what is in the rhyme itself. Um, the dish ran away with the spoon, but the dish fell down and broke into pieces. So <laughs> it's kind of, you might say, well, tragic or sad, but it's presented in a funny way. And so Caldecott is engaging children in very complex emotions, things that don't, how can sad and funny go together is sort of the question. And he's leaving you to fix, sort that out for yourself. And it's another way that he was realistic. He was showing that there were different aspects of life that can seem contradictory, but they all happen anyway. Next. Um, and here's another example um, where he's, in a sense, taking on death, this mad dog um, whose ad adventures or misadventures you see inside the book. 
and he's showing you the ending on the cover. Um, the next picture. Um, here you see the dog is biting a very respectable gentleman's leg. Um, so again, he's, um, he's not being, he's the opposite of sentimental. He's making fun of um, adults who maybe are a little bit full of themselves. And um, he's giving the children um, something very kind of exciting to laugh at. Next picture. Um, and here, again, people are so scared of the dog that they're climbing trees and so on. So it's, um, it's like, you know, vaudeville. It's um, farce. Next. Um, or he's just showing young people having a great time uh, in a little town dancing in the street in the evening at sunset. Uh, always about motion, though, one way or another. Next picture. Um, this is Beatrix Potter. She was a child when Caldecott was making his books. And her father, who was a very successful lawyer in London, collected art. And one of the artists whose work he collected was Randolph Caldecott. So Kate Greenway, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Beatrix Potter grew up in this very fine house in London with original art by Caldecott on the walls. And um, I mean, she did have a tutor who helped her learn how to paint, but a lot of it, um, a lot of her uh, understanding of art was self um, learned. From, from practice, and so she was looking at Caldecott art um, as she was forming herself into an artist. Um, and she later wrote um, with the greatest reverence about Caldecott as you know, the master, the, the great one. Um, next picture. And here you can see, this is one of Caldecott's books. He di generally didn't do animals, but once in a while he did. And this is one of um, Beatrix Potter's books where you can see d the direct connection between the two artists. Um, ah, yeah. So now we switch to America, um, and we're in the 1920s, and um, America, uh, Andrew Carnegie has built 1,600 uh, public libraries, each with a children's room. The librarians um, uh, of children's, uh, the children's librarians are a committed group, a new profession, and they want to create a whole system for, for bringing excellent books to children. One of the things they did was start the world's first um, magazine of children's literature criticism called The Horn Book, which still publishes almost 100 years later, six times a year. And for their cover to sort of, sort of signal what it was that they considered a good children's book, they took this image from one of Caldecott's picture books and put it on the cover of their magazine. So that's a, a good illustration of how America was so um, beholden to um, the British tradition, so respecting, respectful of and admiring of the British tradition. And next page, a uh, next slide. Um, and then 10 years later, the Caldecott Medal was created in 1938. That was the first year it was given. And not coincidentally, it was the first year that Superman comics came out. Because librarians and lots of parents and teachers thought the comics were sub-literary and sub-artistic and maybe a, just a generally a bad influence. Children loved them, so that it was very frustrating for all these people who thought they knew what was best. Um, but it was a way, this medal was a way for the librarians who you know, thought of themselves as the experts of their time to say, well, you know, children may like these comic books, but here's what we think is really good. So we're gonna put our, our you know, mark of approval on the really great picture books and hope that children find them. Um, so I love the, the, t the timing, that the, the two things happen exactly at the same time. Next picture. Um, so uh, Maurice Sendak um, began his career in the 50s, so now we're fast forwarding another 20 years. Um, and of course he was you know, very prolific, he won recognition early on, and about 15 years into his career created Where the Wild Things Are, which is one of the best known picture books ever in the world. Um, he looked to Caldecott, um, for inspiration and for lessons in story t visual storytelling. Um, books like Where the Wild Things Are owe a lot to the Caldecott picture books, including that breaking up of sentences, the pacing, uh, the you know, juxtapo juxtaposing pages with words and no words, mixing it up in all sorts of ways to keep the children guessing and engaged and, and to sort of transport them into the world of the book uh, where things can happen that don't happen anywhere else, just on the page. Um, so he said, um, the word quicken best suggests the genuine spirit of Randolph Caldecott's animation 
the breathing of life, the surging swing into action that I consider an essential quality in pictures for children's books. And that really sums up what Caldecott did pretty well. Next picture. So here I just want to show you a, a glimpse of the influence of Caldecott. So here from the 1940s is Make Way for Ducklings. And if you remember the horseman galloping across the page. Um, so that's from the 40s. Next picture. This is from the 50s. Um, a Russian emigre who came to New York. Uh, next picture. And Sendak. So you could go on and on. Um, and a lot of these artists, Sendak was a student of um, the history of illustration, so he knew. But a lot of them had no idea that they were influenced by Caldecott, but they were anyway, because what he came up with in terms of the best way of using pictures and integrating them with words to tell a story um, in a sort of rapid fire way, um, I mean, he created, in a sense, the manual for how to do it. Um, next picture. Um, he never lost his um, flair for business, his banker side. Um, here's another one of his letter illustrations where he's created a sort of um, imaginary poster which claims that his books are good for influenza and headache. They even, they even cure you of things. <laughs> That's how good they are. <laughs> so, um, so here, uh, closing up here, um, is a drawing that he did in Brittany, uh, self-portrait. There he is with his little straw hat on. And he's make, sketching for the local children in a resort where he liked to hang out sometimes. And here, 100 years later, is a cover of the Hornbook magazine, that magazine I mentioned a moment ago, um, drawn by Marie Sendak, um, paying homage to um, Caldecott by showing one of his character, one of his wild things looking over Caldecott's shoulder in order to sort of learn, learn from the master. Uh, next picture. Yeah, and oh, the end. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the end of my talk. But if you want to ask questions or make comments, I bet there are very knowledgeable people here who'd like to tell stories that I don't know. Uh, we could do that now. Anybody? Have you been to his grave? No, I haven't. I have photos of it. I have friends have gone there, yeah, but I haven't been down to. He, it, w he was buried in St. Augustine, Florida. Yeah. 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 Well, I've been to his grave, yeah. Ah, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Would you say his pictures are still as popular with children now in America? No, no. unfortunately. Um, I think some of the texts that he illustrated, you know, aren't really. Um, of it wouldn't be of interest to mm -hmm. children today, like the John Gilpin story. Mm -hmm. um, the nursery rhymes, I would say yes. Mm -hmm. um, th there's been so much um, done in the last hundred years in the way of picture books. Mm -hmm. And, you know, art has their fashions and trends in art. And um, I, think s I think most of his books would look old fashioned to mm -hmm. children mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. um, but they can still be appreciated, I think, um, maybe by children who are older than the usual picture book age mm -hmm. because the drawing is so strong and so mm -hmm. funny. So is that, is that um, replicated in art schools? Are art students introduced to Caldecott pictures? Um, well, I mean, I teach a, a history of the picture book at the oh School yeah. of Visual Arts, which is one of the art schools in New York, and I certainly do. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not sure um, if everyone does. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I would describe his work as foundational, so I, I think it would be remiss not to make reference to what his contributions were. Because even though, in fact, almost because the books in some ways look old-fashioned, you can sort of, um, they become like x-rays, um, which reveal the thinking behind them, you know, and, and that's, that's like, um, that's timeless, yeah. I mean, he really got to the core of what that kind of artwork can do. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I'm, I don't know anything about the topic, but I'm getting the feeling that there were children's books before Caldecott, mm -hmm. but then you've got animation and life from mm -hmm. his books. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so, so it's moved through a phase. Where does he fit in in terms of the, the journey from no children's books to the 
Mm -hmm. magazine. Right. What, what was before? Well, there were books in the 18th century. I mean, there were a few books even in the 17th century. Um, some with pictures, yeah. Mm -hmm. They tended to be books either of instruction, um, books about things you should know about the real world, or books about how to behave, mm -hmm. um, how to be a good person, how to be a good child, or books about salvation, mm -hmm. you know, how to be prepare yourself mm -hmm. for the next life. Mm -hmm. um, so they tended to be about um, children as they ought to be, mm -hmm. one way or another. Mm -hmm you know, either more knowledgeable or better morally or in terms of behavior. So it shifted from books about how children ought to be to, ch to how children are, how they really are. And part of that is, I mean, that's related in part to the freedom to make fun of the adult world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like we're all human, we all have flaws, mm -hmm. and we trust children to, you know, not become totally, you know, Im you know uh, unbearable if we show that adults can be made fun of from time to time. Mm -hmm. So books like Edward Lear's mm -hmm. Book of Nonsense from the 40s and Lewis Carroll from the 60s mm -hmm. were um, very powerful um, uh, early works in that trend which continues to this day. Mm -hmm. You know, So um, um, in Caldecott's lifetime it became possible to print in color and that attracted a higher quality of mm -hmm. artists because it meant that the possibilities were much greater for expression. Um, and so he kind of, his timing was very good. Mm -hmm. um, it was the first um, great age of illustration for children. Mm -hmm. And I think there were three who all worked with the same printer, Edmund Evans. He was a printer and an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And um, so he would put a book together and then sell it to a it's like we would call it a packager these days. Mm -hmm. um, but he would bring the artist together with the text and then he would oversee the printing and then send it off to the publisher to sell. And so he worked with three, um, Kate Greenaway, and they're all well known, um, Walter Crane and Caldecott. Mm -hmm. And Crane was the first one and um, he worked Crane really hard. And uh, Crane I think was kind of a pushover when it came to business because he never got paid that well. Mm -hmm. And after a while, the resentment built and built. <laughs> but Caldecott came along with his banking background. And uh, Kate Greenaway was also a very sharp businesswoman. And the two of them replaced um, Crane mm -hmm. in the sort of stable. Uh, it took two to replace him. And um, they each went on to do books which were enormously popular. Um, so that showed that picture books could be popular. I mean, Caldecott's books sold like 50,000 copies within the first year. That's, today that would be good. And the, you know, the population was much smaller in those days. Mm -hmm. So that caught the eye of somebody like Beatrix Potter of the next generation and of other ver very, very talented artists. Mm -hmm. And notice that like she as a woman you know, had, uh, could have been a botanical illustrator, but as a woman was not accepted by this world of science. So she had to go somewhere where she would be accepted and children's books was, you know, it was like women's work to some extent. Mm -hmm. And um, so it built on itself. Mm -hmm. So Caldecott was, I would say, in the early days of what, what you might call the modern phase mm -hmm. that we still li live in, uh, where the books were more focused on uh, life as it is rather than life as it should be, uh, with greater and greater, um, you know, technological uh, firepower mm -hmm. to to bring it uh, to the fore for, for, for a young audience. How did that overlap with comics? Um, well, um, I mean, comic books didn't start until the 1930s. Mm -hmm. Comic strips and newspapers, I think, started in the 1890s. Mm -hmm. And um, before that, there were satirical, like, broadsheets, mm -hmm. like, in England, certainly, and in Germany and other places. Um, so, you know, depending on how you kind of define the tradition, you can trace it back quite a way, um, uh, comics. Um, Did he get involved with them or not? Did he? Yeah. Well, in, the, in a way, I mean, he came close because the, the graphic um, uh, illustrations they did, the stories about like vacationing in France, were sequential drawings. I mean, like do dozens of drawings mm -hmm. telling a continuous story. So they didn't have word balloons, but mm -hmm. apart from that, they were essentially and they were, you know, rendered in a more realistic way than we associate with comics, mm -hmm. but they had a lot in common with comics. Yeah. Um, it strikes me that the, the humor is peculiarly English, 
British uh, had his work travelled abroad in other languages and been reproduced in other countries? Um, well, it was published in his lifetime in France and in the United States. Um, I don't know, I don't, I, I, I don't think I've ever heard of German editions, but I wouldn't be too surprised to find out if there were. Mm. But he was a hit. In fact, there's a story that um, after his first couple of books came out, they came out to a year, he took a vacation to France and was in a hotel, um, and he picked up a newspaper and found a review of, of his book, uh, you know, from a French reviewer. Mm. And, you know, which is, of course, a wonderful thing for a author and artist to experience. Um, so, and I know that his books sold really well um, in, in all those places. Yeah? We, we all, all know um, many of the nursery rhymes. Did he write any of the nursery rhymes or were they nursery rhymes that have been going on? For yeah, they were, they, they were uh, there, you know, uh, there for the taking. They, they, he, he didn't write them, no. I mean, the great Pandrandrum, uh, he didn't write that one either, but, um, um, so no, I don't think he wrote any of his stories. Yeah. He did illustrate um, a comic for children ah. called Auntie Judy. Ah, okay. And he was very popular. Uh, I think they went into print quite extensively, though, at six pence a magazine. Ah. Mm. Ah, so yeah. Oh. And um, the, the house that Jack built was a very great favourite of mine, and we actually discovered through the Randolph Oldercock Society here that uh, he visited this farmhouse not far from where my farmhouse was here, yeah. and he used to live in there, and um, I think I, I've forgotten it. I'm getting rather old now. No, it wasn't Culver Hall. It was uh, a farmhouse and um, near Bickerton. Yeah. 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 And uh, we learned all. I learned to read the land of Culver Ah, that's wonderful. And I've had them all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Closely huh. related to uh, huh. his family. Huh. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. Wow. Huh. Yeah. And I just Huh. Oh. Visited the loft where the uh, cat was and the children. It's a pity there are not someone here somewhere huh. that uh, created the cat and uh, did um, a material one, and we just loved it. Huh. Oh, that's so wonderful. Thank you for telling that story. <laughs> huh. Yes, sir. Do you have a favourite children's book, Leonard? Uh, I mean, of all children's books? Yeah, but I hope they tell the <laughs> <laughs> um, Well, I mean, I, because I've done a lot of reviewing and all, done all kinds of things with children's books, I've, um, I, I've seen so many that I, that I do care about. Um, I mean, outside of Caldecott, um, Good Night Moon, you know, is a book that people read uh, as a kind of nighttime lullaby to young okay. children. Yeah, and I, I wrote a biography of the author, so I, I spent a lot of time trying to, it's a very simple seeming book, but there's a lot, there's a, a huge backstory to that book, and which was fun to uncover. And, um, and I'm, it makes reference to nursery rhymes, so, and she, the author Margaret Weiss Brown, certainly would have been an admirer of, of Caldecott's, and I would say the illustrator of that book, Clement Hurd, whether knowingly or not, was very much influenced by Caldecott's approach to illustration. Um, yeah, um, I'm just thinking um, of his books. I mean, I, I, you know, because of this event, I took another look at the Great Panjandrum, and it's such a crazy, fun story that I, I, I just, you can't sort of get to the bottom of it. You know, you think you can sort of unravel the code, but you can't. <laughs> so I, I kind of, I really enjoy that. And there was an argument between two actors, and one hated the other, uh -huh. and they tried to uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, uh yeah. Yeah. It's just, um, it's, it's really so much fun. It's like pure fun because um, it's not anything else. <laughs> yeah. I, I, uh, my, my grandson was a great fan of Tintin. Oh, yeah. Hellboy stories. And 
just won the, the, the French connection. Uh, <laughs> oh. Um, it's possible. Yeah. I mean, Caldecott really had a, was everywhere. You know, I think a lot of artists in the 20s and 30s would have known his books. And I know that um, New York Public Library, which was influential throughout the U.S. in terms of what it chose to put on its shelves, had copies of all the Caldecott books in every single branch library, which would be like 60 or 70 libraries around the city. And that meant because so many artists live in, in New York that, you know, up and coming illustrators would have been exposed to his work. Um, you know, Sendak being one of many, many examples. Um, I don't know specifically about the Tintin Tin books, but it's possible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when, when the Caldecott Medal is being considered, um, do you have a panel of people in America? Or yeah. just one or two regulars? No, it's 15 librarians, uh -huh. and the committee makeup changes every I think year or two, to okay. some extent, yeah. they're, they're, you know, it, it shifts in, p in parts, mm -hmm. and um, they tend to be all librarians. I think mm -hmm. um, some of them are very knowledgeable, you know, some not so knowledgeable, <laughs> 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 but ge generally they they do know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah. yeah, and they, you know, they saw themselves, they set themselves up as the guardians of children's literature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you mentioned the work he did for the graphic. Yeah. Magazine. Um, he did do an enormous amount of what we I think perhaps nowadays call travel logs mm -hmm. when he was in the south of France, Monaco, and in Italy for his health. Mm -hmm. And also in this country when he visited Buxton and uh, mm -hmm. Scarborough and yeah. various other spa mm -hmm. cities yeah. and towns. I mean and they're published, uh, as you know, I'm sure, in, in a big book, a full collection of them. Mm -hmm. They're well worth looking at. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I mean, considering th that he wasn't that strong, you know, mm -hmm. it's amazing how much, he, I mean, I think he, you get the sense that he was always pushing himself, mm -hmm. yes. you know, and taking on challenges, which I find admirable, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you know if uh, he ever met uh, Beatrix Potter? Um, they did not meet, and let me just think, I think um, she was maybe too young, um, he died in, I forget what year she was born in, but he died in 1886, mm, yeah. and um, she was probably very young. It, I mean, it's it's conceivable because her father um, would take her um, to meet artists that he was interested in. Mm. Um, but in fact, I, I think I can say for sure that they did not meet because right. there was a long letter that Beatrix Potter wrote to someone who inquired about their friendship, and she certainly would have mentioned that if, yeah. if they had met. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well. Okay. Well, I just want to add this a really nice element alongside yeah. your talk. So yeah. thank you for your questions, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. Th thank you. Um, our friends in the USA, thank you for joining us. And anyone that's signed up and is watching the live stream on YouTube, uh, thank you for Wild Edric um, doing the footage for us. And uh, we hope to see you at another event very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.